You ever feel like you're all alone and no one cares about you? I want you to know something. You're not alone. God cares about you. God loves you. And you don't have to ever be lonely again because Jesus Christ can come and live inside of your heart and be your Savior and your Lord. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship with God. He's just a prayer away. You can just pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I, I want you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I want to start this relationship with you now. If you'll pray a prayer like that, God will hear it and answer it. And you can know that you'll have purpose in this life and hope in the life to come. And if you prayed that prayer, let me send you a Bible at no charge to help you get started in your relationship with God. From the author of Johnny Cash, The Redemption of an American Icon, and Steve McQueen, The Salvation of an American Icon, comes a new book titled Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, which traces the journeys, rise, fall, and sometimes redemption of famous rock gods who were brought to their knees and looked up to finally meet the one true God. In the pages of Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, you'll discover the excess and self-absorption, but also of sweet salvation and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Greg Laurie will use his own memories, interviews, and observation to draw from the lives of famous entertainers. We'll travel with them as they descend to the depths of hell before ascending to the highest heaven. Request your copy of Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus when you give today. Hey, Southern California, Greg Laurie here. You know, there's nothing like gathering together in person to worship the Lord and hear the Word of God. And I want to personally invite you to live worship at our church campuses. There's two you can choose from. Our service times are 9 in the morning and 11 in the morning. So join us as we meet both inside and outside every Sunday morning. Hey, I'm Jonathan Laurie, and welcome to this weekend's edition of Harvest at Home. I'll be your host for this service, and it's so great to have you all joining us from all over the place, all over the U.S., and even across the world. Uh, we've got a great service planned for you. We're going to hear some songs from the Harvest Worship Team, and then an awesome message uh, from my dad as we continue in our series on the topic of Elijah, this amazing character, this amazing man of God. Uh, and our, our message title today is Exit Stage Left, and we're going to be in the book of First Kings. And so if you want to get ready and prepare your hearts, we're going to jump into worship right now. And also I'd encourage you, um, if you have friends or family that uh, maybe aren't doing anything this weekend or they're free right now, man, shoot them a text and let them know. Tune into harvest.org. Check out their program. Check out their, uh, the YouTube channel and this new series that's going on. You know, we've had all kinds of people share that because somebody sent them a link and invited them to tune in for the services, they jumped in and man, they loved it. And so we would love for you to share this program on their, uh, your social media or texting, whatever it might be. And so uh, we're going to jump into worship right now. And so why don't we commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask now that uh, as we are all over the place watching this service online, watching this service um, from our homes, maybe in our cars, maybe listening to this as a podcast later on, whatever it might be, Lord, we just ask that you would minister to our hearts uh, through the time of worship. And also, Lord, we would be encouraged and challenged as we hear about this amazing character of Elijah and the things that he did. And so we pray that this service would bless you, Lord, that it would be true and it would be um, beneficial to us. And so we ask that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You guys ready to sing today? We're going to sing the most popular scripture that most people know. It's for God so loved the world. If you need it, you can open your Bible if that helps. Let's sing together. Come all you weary. Come all you Come all you thirst, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table he will satisfy. 
taste of his goodness Find what you're looking for Sing this chorus with us That was the Harvest Worship Team, and I'm Jonathan Laurie, and you are watching this weekend's edition of Harvest at Home. Hey, we want to let you know about an uh, amazing new resource that we have. My dad has written a brand new book called Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. Uh, this is a book that he has, has been putting together really over the last, I would say, 69 years of his life. And in this book, he chronicles the spiritual journeys of so many of these rock and roll stars, all the way from Bob Dylan, John Lennon, Alice Cooper, Johnny Cash, uh, Elvis Presley, uh, all kinds of people and their spiritual journey and how um, some of them made professions of faith, put their faith in Christ and completely were transformed by the gospel. Some of them never made a profession of faith and they completely lived their lives uh, devoted to sex, drugs, rock and roll. And of course, we know how uh, those things often end. And so the main thrust of my dad's book is that nobody is beyond the reach of God. This is an amazing book and we want to give it to you. It's our gift to you this weekend for your gift of any size. And I will say that um, as you partner with our ministry here at Harvest, uh, one of the things we love to do is proclaim the gospel. We love to let people know about Jesus. We love to um, do great Bible teaching and provide great music. And so when you partner with us, you are helping us to do 
uh, what God has called us to, uh, what we've been doing for over, well, 49 years now that we've been doing this as a ministry. Um, but here at Harvest at Home, we've been really leaning into this since 2020. And so for your gift of any size this weekend, and we will send you your copy of Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. And uh, there's some information up on your screen, a website that you can visit. And we'll get you your copy of Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus for your gift of any size. And as you select, whether it's a one-time gift or a recurring gift, um, whatever you choose to uh, be generous with us today, we just want to say thank you and God bless you. Hey, so right now we are going to watch something very special. My dad recently did an interview with uh, Alice Cooper, the guy who's on the cover of this book. And he talked to Alice about his, his faith journey and ultimately how Alice has put his faith in Jesus Christ. This may as, uh, come as a surprise to some of you, but man, Alice really is the real deal. He was sold out for Jesus. And so we want to show you that interview and then we're going to have one more song together and then we'll hear the message from my dad. So check this interview out. Cheryl had gone, she'd gone to Chicago and said, I can't watch this, right? Yeah. But the cocaine was speaking a lot louder than her. And uh, finally, I, I, I looked in the mirror, and it looked like my makeup, yeah. but it was blood wow. coming down. I think I might have been hallucinating. Gotcha. I don't know. Flushed the rock down the toilet and went to bed for three days. And uh, I woke up, and I called her, and I said, it's done. And she goes, right. You know, she said, you have to prove it. And that was, you know, that was the beginning of our relationship coming back. Of course, one of the deals was we start going to church because yeah. I was a prodigal son. Yeah. Remember, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor. My yeah. granddad was a, uh, an evangelist. And when the, when the band happened, it took me as far away as you could possibly. I was a poster boy for everything wrong. Yeah. And then when I got sober and everything, came back to the church, realizing that's where I belonged there. So we started going to, and it, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I, I came to Christ because my love of Jesus. I came to Christ because of my fear of God. Wow. I totally understood that hell was not getting high with Jim Morrison. Yeah. <laughs> hell was going to be the worst place ever. In fear, I came back to the Lord. But I went to another church and that pastor preached the love of Christ, yeah. which now you put the two together yeah. and it was exactly right. And I knew, in other words, I knew who Christ was, Jesus Christ yeah. was. And I was denying him yeah. because I was living my own life and I was living my life without him. I knew that there had to either come a point where I either accepted Christ and started living that life, or if I died in this, yeah. I was in a lot of trouble. Yeah.
Let's grab our Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17, we're looking at the life of Elijah and the title of my message is Exit, Stage Left. Let me start with a question. Have you ever faced a time in your life where you were isolated and alone? Maybe your friends and family even abandoned you. Maybe your husband or your wife walked out on you. Maybe even your dog left you. Cats always leave you. They've never been your friend. Just deal with that. Or maybe you're, right now as I'm giving this message, you're in a time of difficulty or trial, similar to a desert, because there once was a time in your life where you were active, but now you're inactive. Once you were mobile, now you're immobilized. If any of these things resonate with you, and I think this message I'm about to share with you will help because this is a story of the prophet Elijah storming into the court of the wicked King Ahab and his even more wicked wife Jezebel and throwing the gauntlet down at the nerve center of Israel and telling these idol worshiping people that it wasn't gonna rain. God was gonna withhold the water because of their worship of false gods. And here's where Elijah got his boldness, his courage, his chutzpah, if you will. First Kings 17, one, and Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there will not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. What were the secrets of this miracle working prophet? By the way, he was a human just like you are, just like me. He had his shortcomings and his flaws. We'll see that later. He says it in his opening statement, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. Elijah served a living God. He knew God was alive and powerful and he constantly stood in the presence of God. He understood that wherever he went, the Lord went with him. And so that gave him a courage. And that's something that will give you courage as well. So when he first walked in, I think that probably Ahab and Jezebel thought he was a joke. How did this guy get past security? Remember, he's kind of wild looking. He's all hairy, dressed strangely. And they're in their beautiful royal robes. And, and he makes this bold statement. They probably thought, that's such a joke. And then it stopped raining. <laughs> and it wasn't a joke anymore. 
And suddenly Elijah became public enemy number one. Basically the queen and the king put a contract out on him. We gotta get this guy whacked fast because he is a threat to our nation. So what was Elijah to do? It's exit, stage left. The Lord said you gotta get off the grid. No Instagram posts. No tweets, no anything. Nobody needs to know where you are because the Lord said to him in verse two, you've got to hide yourself. By the way, I just read an interesting little article that said one week off of social media can ease your depression and anxiety. One week. And they said you also gain nine hours of free time that you did not have. Think about that. I'm gonna go off social for one week while Elijah was off the grid, nobody knew exactly where he was. Why was he hiding? Because the king and queen wanted him dead, but also because God was getting him into shape for what was ahead. So Elijah went from the palace to the barren wilderness. He went from the throne of power to the desert of obscurity. He's in oblivion, and here's what happened. First Kings 17, verse two. And the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by the Cherith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and camped beside Cherith Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat. Each morning and evening he drank from the brook, and after a while the brook dried up, and there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. We'll stop there. Okay, if you're taking notes, here's point number one. We learn things in deserts, that we don't learn anywhere else. We learn things in deserts we don't learn anywhere else. And when I say desert, I'm using it as a metaphor for a difficulty, a trial, a hardship, whatever it is you might be going through similar to that, but you will learn things in that place. Now when we think of the brook Cherith, we think of a little babbling brook, you know, sort of like Snow White in the forest and the animals are gathered around smiling. No, it wasn't that way at all. Actually, the word cherith means the cutting place. The cutting place. God was getting Elijah ready for his showdown with the prophets of Baal. It was gonna be the shootout at the Carmel Corral. This was gonna be big. And he was gonna have to be almost a different person when that event came with incredible faith. This was sort of like Elijah's boot camp experience. You know, at the beginning of the chapter, he's introduced to us as Elijah from the town of Tishbeth. At the end of the chapter, he is introduced as Elijah, the man of God. Something happened in that cutting place. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody right now, it's in a cutting place or a spiritual desert. You're walking through a valley, but you need to know you're not the only one. Moses spent 40 years in the desert before he was able to lead the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt. Joseph spent a number of years in a prison cell before he became the second most powerful man in the earth and saved the lives of many people. Spall, Paul, not Spall, there is no Spall. <laughs> Spall was Paul's brother, but there's not much about him in the Bible. No, Paul. Paul spent three lonely years in the Arabian desert after his conversion and before he began his public ministry. For us, our cutting place was 14 years ago when we entered into a valley that in many ways we're still in. And that is the valley or the cutting place when our son Christopher died in an automobile accident. Uh, it's a very hard thing to go through and anyone who has lost a loved one, especially a child, knows what I'm speaking of right now. But I have to say, in this valley we have been in, we have learned things we would not have otherwise learned. We've come closer to God, and the Lord has been with us in a special way, and He has changed us and continues to change us, and He'll do the same for you no matter what kind of valley you're in. I love how David sums it up in Psalm 23. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Then he gives the answer, for you are with me. See, if the Lord is with me, I, I can get through it. When you know the Lord is with you, you can face anything. I'd rather be in a desert with Jesus than anywhere else without him. And that's what Elijah understood. 
See, exciting and exhilarating days were ahead for the prophet, including Mount Carmel. But before there would be a Mount Carmel, there had to first be a brook called Cherith. There has to be a cross before there can be a crown. Before there can be a resurrection, there has to be a Gethsemane and a Calvary. There has to be death before there can be life. Jesus said, if you will lose your life, you'll find it. What does that mean? It means that if you will give your life to God and recognize that his plans for you are better than your plans for yourself, you will find another dimension of life that you had not known even existed. But we ask, oh man, come on. Why do I have to go through these valleys? Why do I have to go through these trials? Why do I have to weather these storms? Why can I just go from mountaintop to mountaintop? Here's the answer, James 1, 2. Brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its work in you that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Number two, God allows trials in the life of the Christian so we will grow up spiritually. You know, we think we know certain things and the Lord will test us periodically. Did you know God gives pop quizzes? Remember when you were in school? Some of you are in school still. The teacher would say, it's pop quiz today. All the nerds and the geeks would be like, <laughs> right? And they even laugh that way, <laughs> uh, not me. I was like, oh no. Because I was a guy drawing cartoons, distracting other students, messing around. Why were the geeks and the needs? Uh, well, I'm making new words up. <laughs> so we have Spall, the brother of Paul, and now we have Gertz and Speeds, or whatever I said. <laughs> but why were the geeks and the nerds so excited? Because they were prepared. By the way, we don't call them geeks and nerds anymore. We call them boss now, pretty much. Right? <laughs> It's a good thing to be a geek today, especially if you know how to fix computer things. But um, Jesus will test us. Oh, you think you know this? You say you trust me? You say that you believe I'm in charge in your life? Here comes the test. Not to make us miserable, not to hurt us, to test our faith and strengthen our faith so we'll understand this truth is really true, you see? So we can advance as Christians. Thirdly, God allows hardships to show us his power. Sometimes he'll just allow a, allow a difficulty so he can deliver you from it or even remove the difficulty from you. Now, honestly, there are times we have to go through it and we're not delivered, but then there are times he'll take us out of it all together. And fourth, trials and testings produce a necessary quality in our life. Let me go back to that statement from James 2 and read it from another translation that sheds some light. James 1, verse 2. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't treat them as intruders, but friends. I love that. Trial comes, I don't want a trial, intruder, no. Maybe it's a friend. Why would it be a friend? Realize, James continues, that they come to test your faith and produce in you a quality of endurance. Let that process go on until your men and women of mature character, men and women of integrity with no weak spots. Sort of like working out at the gym. How many of you go to the gym or to some kind of a health club every week? Raise your hand. Okay, not a lot of fit people in this service. <laughs> I think it was even worse for service in Riverside. <laughs> All right, so you don't, you don't go to the gym. I, I, I go, but I don't like it. My favorite time of going to the gym is when the workout is over, and it's all the obnoxious people. Like the guy who picks the weights up and then slams them on the ground, right? Or the person that sweats all over everything. Sweat, sweat. And then how about this person taking pictures of themselves where they work out? Please don't do that. I don't want to scroll through and see you working out. I just don't. But a lot of people like to, here I am in the gym, look at me now, you know, that sort of thing. Well, look, you go to the gym to get stronger, not weaker. You break down the muscle in order to build up the muscle. God does the same for us. Trials are like God's gym where he's strengthening us for the present and for the future. It's been said character is not made in crisis. It is revealed. So here now is Elijah in his time of trial, 
by the brook cherub. Now he's gonna get fed every day, how? Ravens, basically, Raven Postmates is the new delivery system. <laughs> now I want you to think about a raven for a moment. I don't know what you think of when you think of a raven. Here's a photograph of a raven. Uh, not the prettiest bird out there. Uh, these are birds that, well let's just say you see a dead squirrel in the middle of the street and you go, oh sick, gross. That bird, that's called lunch. He's happy to see it. So they're bringing little bits of meat and some bread to Elijah. It's not like they're flying in with little bags of In-N-Out Burger and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> By the way, I invented my own sandwich at Chick-fil-A. It's very exciting. Do you want me to reveal it to you? It's my own thing. Okay, so I take the regular Chick-fil-A. I like that. And then you know the spicy one? I take the spicy filet, put it on top of the old filet, and that's it. <laughs> You'll thank me later. This is why I have to go to the gym because I eat stuff like this. But uh, so the food comes every single day. How would he let the birds know it was time to eat? He would shoot out a tweet. And they would always arrive. You missed the joke. Tweet birds. Come on, people. <laughs> These are the jokes. You know, it's funny to me though. What a weird way to feed someone. Why not go back to the manna miracle? That was a good one. You get up in the morning as a child of Israel, walk out of your little tent, there's a manna waiting for you. You have manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. But now Elijah's gotta wait on birds to bring little bits of meat and some bread to him each and every day. I think the reason the Lord did this is God likes to mix it up. Have you ever noticed that Jesus never healed any two people in exactly the same way? Sometimes they touched him, like the woman who had the medical condition, and she was healed. Sometimes he touched them. Sometimes he would just speak the word and they would be healed. One of my favorites is when a guy wanted to be healed of blindness and Jesus spit on the ground and wiped it in the dirt and put it in his eye. Can you imagine? You come to a pastor for prayer. Pastor, would you pray for me? No problem. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. Yeah, only one so. But I think Jesus changed his methods, if you will, so people would not look to the method, but they would look to the Messiah. God may provide for you in a certain way for an extended period of time, and you come to almost trust in that thing instead of him. Well, I've always worked at this organization and they pay me every week, yes, but it's God who has been giving you that money, ultimately, right? It's God who's been providing for you. So the Lord may mix it up and something may happen and all of a sudden your provision isn't coming from that source anymore. It's coming from another source and you discover it was never from that source. It was always from this source, the Lord himself. So the birds come and bring him his food. Maybe the Lord did it this way so Elijah would have a little companionship. You know, he's all alone out there. Nobody to talk to. Probably name the birds. Oh, here they come. We have a little bird feeder outside of our window in our kitchen. And uh, so we have these birds that come. We name the birds. And there are two birds that kind of dominate it. There, there was one that was there all the time. And my granddaughter Allie named, um, named her, now I'm blanking out on her name, um, Irene. Irene, what, what, she's a kid. Irene, she says to so the bird, okay, it's good. Well now all of a sudden she shows up with some boy bird. He's kind of got a little red front here. He's, he's a pretty bird. So, well, let's name him George, I said. George and Irene. You say, why George? I don't know, I thought George Clooney, I don't know. We could have called him Brad or Leo or Greg, I don't know, but. <laughs> so they hang out. Oh, look, they're the birds. We'll stop what we're doing. Look at the birds, there they go. Now I have a hummingbird feeder too. And we recently moved it and now the hummingbirds aren't coming anymore. They're so aloof. Hummingbirds are like the cats of the bird world. You know, they're, they're fickle. George and Irene, every day that they're getting the seed. Hummingbird, I may come, I may not come, I don't know. But I am pretty awesome. They're very hyper. Is there caffeine and nectar? I don't know what's going on with them. But maybe a little companionship for Elijah. Maybe he even started to enjoy it. Get him in the morning, yeah, get some water from the brook and 
wait for the birds to show up and bring me lunch. And then one day, the brook dried up. The brook just dried up, it stopped. See, he had to face the consequences of the plague coming on the land too. Uh, there was a drought and now he's facing the drought. And I wonder if I'm talking to somebody right now who just had their brook dry up. Your bank account isn't as full as it once was. I think that's true for most of us right now with this economy. You had a growing career. Not so much anymore. You had an amazing ministry and it's not what it used to be. Your brook dried up. Your career stalled. Things aren't looking so bright as they were before. Your kids left home, which frankly is a relief because they're in their 50s, but still. <laughs> your brook has dried up. But don't despair because God is not done with you yet. God was not done with Elijah. He was just done with this chapter in the life of the prophet. Now Elijah was ready for the next act. He was ready for the next chapter in his life. Everything was going according to plan. God's plan. I know it's been said before, but there is truth in it. When God closes one door, he opens another. The brook dried up, but now the Lord's saying, all right, I have some other things to teach you, so let's move right along. You never know. I read about some farmers who are raising cotton in the south, and the dreaded bull weevil invaded and started eating their crops. Now, look at that cr creepy thing. The bull weevil, a lot of creepy animals today. Ravens and bull weevils. And so these bugs show up and they just destroy crops of cotton. And the farmers began to despair. They had invested their life savings into these crops. But then one of them had an idea, why don't we plant peanuts instead? Amazingly, those peanuts made them more money than they ever had made with cotton. So they had a monument dedicated to the bull weevil. I'm not making this up, look at this. This is real. This is not photoshopped. Here's this monument, thank you bull weevil. And sometimes a bull weevil comes into your life. What's this all about? What's this person doing here? Why did this problem start? Why is this happening to me? And then later you look back and you go, thank God for the bull weevil. Thank God for that interruption because it caused me to pivot and go this different direction that I would have never gone in before. And so God was still at work in the life of Elijah. And sometimes weird stuff happens in our life that doesn't always make sense at the time. Think about it. Paul was in the middle of a very successful missionary journey when he was stoned and left for dead. You might say his brook dried up. <laughs> but then God raised him up and he went on to change the world. Joseph was on a roll uh, running the house of Potiphar, but he was falsely accused and sent to prison. His brook had dried up, but God delivered him and he saved the world. So now it's time for chapter three, or act three, in the life of Elijah. The Lord was going to expand Elijah's life and grow his faith. First Kings 17, verse eight. Then the Lord said to Elijah, this is after the brook has dried up, Go to the village of Zarephath and near the city of Zidon. Now, by the way, uh, the city of Zidon, Zidon was the center of Baal worship. This is where Jezebel, the wicked queen, came from. So the Lord is effectively sending Elijah to Baal Central, which is kind of ironic. And then the Lord says there'll be a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, he arrived at the gates of the village. He saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you bring me a little bit of water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, hey, bring me a bite of bread too. <laughs> I find this humorous. Okay, I'll get you some water. Hey, give me a sandwich too, would you mind? But this woman is so gracious. And think of how Elijah looked. He was strange looking, all hairy. And he comes up to this lady who's basically at the brink of death. She even protests and said, I don't have enough bread to share. I'm out of flour and olive oil to make more. This is my last meal. He's like, yeah, whatever. Just give me some to eat. But it wasn't that way. See, he was testing her. And more to the point, the Lord was testing her. Would she trust God? And in this case, the men of God. And she said, yes. And look what happened next, verse 15. 
She did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour, excuse me, of flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. I love how she made things from scratch. My wife is an amazing chef. If you follow me on social media, you see because I post food all the time. In my, uh, my story on Instagram, I, I posted my omelet from this morning. This was an amazing omelet. And she just gets all the ingredients together and makes stuff. I never make anything. I used to make scrambled eggs for myself and there came a point where I couldn't even eat my own food. I mean, I used to make them okay and something went south and now they're the worst. In fact, last time I made them, they were kind of greenish looking. Like, what happened here? The grandkids won't even eat them. They used to eat my eggs and I'll say, do you want me to make you scrambled eggs? No, thank you, Papa. It's like, oh. <laughs> the other day, my granddaughter, Allie, got out some flour and some other things. I said, Allie, what are you doing? She said, I'm gonna make crepes. You're just a little kid, you're making crepes? Very impressive. I am very good at toast, though. I do think that <laughs> I've mastered toast. There is a technique, never mind. So, this widow would make these meals from scratch. But here's something to think about. This was humbling for Elijah. Why? Well, let's be honest. Men, men don't like to be dependent on anyone. Men like to think that we fix things. We're the ones with the answer to the question. We're the ones with a solution to the problem. It's not we aren't as often as we think we are. But to go be dependent on a woman, and not just a woman, a widow, and not just a widow, an impoverished widow, and to be dependent on her each and every day. But this is the thing I find so impressive about Elijah, it was whatever God told him to do, he just did it. He was just obedient. He was obedient in really little things. It may not seem like a big thing to you to sit by a river and let the birds bring you food. It may not seem like a big thing for you uh, to go and be dependent on a widow. It may not seem like a big thing for you to do some of the things he did, but it was the little things that built up to the big things. If you wanna be used by God, you have to be faithful in little things because of this simple truth. You're never too small for God to use, only too big. I mean, this guy went into the court of Ahab and Jezebel and threw down the gauntlet. That was a source of power in Israel. I've had the opportunity to go to the White House quite a few times and I've been in the Oval Office twice, been able to pray for the president. That's an intimidating thing to walk into the Oval Office. For starters, it's actually kind of small. You're thinking, wow, this, what an impractical room. <laughs> it's completely, well, oval. <laughs> and, and, it, and you think of all the history that's happened in that room. And you look at that desk that the president sits behind and the decisions that have been made at that desk. And, and then you're there with the leader of the free world. And that's intimidating as well. Imagine how intimidating it was for Elijah with Ahab and Jezebel. I remember another Oval Office I was in years ago. It was the office of Pastor Chuck Smith. It felt like the Oval Office to me because I was 17 years old. I was a brand new Christian. So I went there to Pastor Chuck's office and I thought, I want to be used by God. So I said, Pastor Chuck, I want to come and serve here. I'll do whatever you need done. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Chuck said, oh, really? I was thinking that it'd say, Greg, why don't you preach for me Sunday morning? I mean, I've been a Christian six months. Why not, right? or go do this other ministry thing, or pray for that person over there. He said, Greg, I want you to go talk to Pastor Romaine. I didn't know who Pastor Romaine was. And then I went to Romaine, hi, Chuck sent me to you, and I, I didn't realize that was like, there was a message, a hidden message there. Like, here's another one, Romaine. As I discovered later, Romaine was a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps prior to being a pastor. So he said, yeah, we want you to do some work. Here's a broom, go sweep. There was this tree called a pepper tree. All it did was drop leaves. I'm thinking, this is the most worthless tree ever planted. You sweep and the leaves drop. And you sweep and the, all I did was sweep under this stupid pepper tree. But I realized what they were doing. They were getting free janitorial work from me. That's what they were doing. <laughs> but there was something else. They were gonna find out, is this kid humble enough to do a menial task? Because if you're not faithful in a little thing like that, 
how can you be given the responsibility to do a greater thing? Jesus said, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you will not be honest with greater responsibilities. Elijah was so faithful and he was so obedient. And he did this for the Lord. And this woman continued to provide for him. Point number five, God loves to take what we have and multiply it. God loves to take what we have and multiply it. I had so little to offer to God after my conversion. Well, I, I draw these cartoons and that's kind of it, you know. But the Lord was giving me gifts that would develop in time. Ironically, for me to be a teacher is almost a, a laugh. The student that got bad grades is now gonna be a teacher? I think the Lord had a little fun with that one. You have no idea what God may call you to do. You say, well, I'm kind of a behind the scenes person. Lord might say, yeah, well, I'm gonna put you in front of everybody. That's a new kind of person you're gonna be. And you might say, I like to be in front of people. I like to have big crowds watching me. The Lord might say, I'm gonna put you behind the scenes now. And another person, he might say, I'm gonna give you this gift that you never had before. It's a supernatural gift to someone else who'll do a different thing. But God loves to take what we have and multiply it. Like that little boy with the loaves and fishes that he gave to the Lord. Listen, there are three things, that's four. There are three things we can give to God. Time, talent, and treasure. Every one of us can give our time, our talent, and our treasure to the Lord. First, there's our time. We have a given day. Will we dedicate any of that time to the Lord? Will we dedicate any of that time to scripture? Will we dedicate any of that time to prayer? Will we dedicate any of that time to worship and church? Will we dedicate any of that time to sharing our faith with others? You have your time, then you have your talent. And we all have different kinds of talents, don't we? And then God may give you gifts on top of those talents, so we give those to him as well. And finally, there's your treasure, your resources. And I have found that God is faithful to provide for our needs if we will honor him. There's an amazing promise in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, where God says, bring all of the tithes into my storehouse that there may be food enough in my temple. And if you do, listen to this promise. If you do, the Lord says, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you, pour you out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Then the Lord says this, Try it. Let me prove it to you. Don't you love that? Here's what God is saying. Take your income. Always give a percentage of it for the work of the kingdom of God. That's why we have an offering, by the way. Maybe you've wondered, what is this mysterious bag passing by? What is happening? That's for you to invest in the kingdom. You don't have to do it. No one's pressuring you to do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But do you realize the blessing that can come your way as you're faithful to give to the Lord. Elijah passed every test that God gave him and the widow did too, but now he's gonna face the biggest test so far. First Kings 17, verse 17, after these things. Underline that phrase, after these things. The son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse. He finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, O man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Wow, pretty accusatory. After these things we read, after what things? After Elijah has trusted God with every test that has come his way. After he faced off with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. After he's gone off the grid and waited for the birds to feed, feed him. Uh, after he's been dependent on this poor woman and seen God provide, after these things, the worst case scenario, her son dies. She even accuses Elijah. And when tragedy strikes, sometimes people lash out at God. Why did you th do this to me, God? Why did you let my son or my daughter die? Why did you let my parents die? Why did you let my sibling die? Why did you let this tragedy befall me? Why am we shake a fist in the face of God? It's understandable, we do it. But uh, we need to remember this simple thing. It's not a punishment when a loved one dies. 
She thinks, why are you punishing me, God? No, sorry to break this to you, people die. The stats on death are pretty impressive. One out of every one person will die, all right? That's why we all need to be prepared for eternity. So it's not a punishment on you. It's life and it's death and it happens to everyone. The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. But I can understand this woman's pain. As I said earlier, my wife and I have been there. But to her credit, Elijah says, give me your son. He took the hit, by the way. He could have said, why are you yelling at me? I've been here helping you all this time. He just says, I, I, I hear you, okay, give me your son. And she says, here. <laughs> There's something in her that knows that God's gonna intervene still. And I wonder if we could just take those things and give them to the Lord. I'm having problems with my son, he's a prodigal. Why don't you just give him to the Lord right now? I'm having problems with my daughter, she's just, uh, it's just so much drama. Why don't you give her to the Lord right now? Having problems with my husband, he's such a loser. Maybe change your attitude and then give him to the Lord. <laughs> I'm having troubles with my wife, hey, give her to the Lord. My career, give it to the Lord. My minister, give it to the Lord. My anxiety, my fears, give it all to the Lord. That's what she did. What happened next? Are you bored? Is this boring? Are you okay? I have like seven more minutes, okay? We good? Not everyone clapped just then, I'm just. <laughs> First Kings 17, verse 21, and he stretched himself over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure you're a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Wow, this took a lot of faith. Um, up to this point, no one had been raised from the dead before, okay? So there was no precedent. Elijah could not have prayed, well Lord, as you've raised people from the dead in the past, do it again. No one had been raised from the dead. This was the first time a person came back from the grave. He was developing next level faith. What Elijah asked God to do with the widow's son was minor compared to what he was gonna ask God to do on Mount Carmel. Listen, God is preparing all of us for what is next. Everything in life is preparation for something that still is yet to come. So let's review and close. Number one, we learn things in deserts. We do not learn anywhere else. Number two, God allows trials in our lives so we will grow spiritually. Thirdly, God allows hardships to show us his power. Fourthly, God or trials and testings produce a necessary quality in our lives. And fifth and lastly, God likes to take what we have and multiply it. Listen to this. You think Elijah was close to God? And he was. God would speak to him, but then the Lord wouldn't speak to him for a while. You say, man, I, I wish God would speak to me like that. Listen to this. You are closer to God as a Christian than Elijah the prophet was. And I'll tell you why. Elijah the prophet stood in the presence of God. He was aware of the presence of God, but you have God himself living inside of you because of what Jesus did on the cross. <laughs> if, that's all caps, if you're a Christian. Well, we're all God's children. No, actually we aren't. We're all created by God. We're all loved by God. But the way you become a child of God is by asking Christ to come into your life after you have acknowledged you're a sinner. This is why Jesus died on the cross, to pay for our sins, and he rose again from the dead. The Bible says, for as many as received him, he gave them the power to become children of God. Have you received Christ into your life? Let me come back to this one point. I can imagine the joy of this mother to have her son back again. I wish God had raised our son, Christopher, from the dead. We couldn't even view him after his accident. 
And I had a dream the other night, and it was so vivid. And you that have lost loved ones will understand this dream. But uh, I was with both of my sons, Christopher and Jonathan. They were both younger. They weren't married yet. So it was just dad and his sons. And we often did things together. And so in this dream, we're standing on a little ledge by the ocean. And both of them are swimming. And they go into this little underwater cave, and I can't see them. But I hear them talking. And uh, Jonathan says to Christopher, you can catch a really cool wave here. And I said, come out of there, I can't see you. I was getting really nervous and agitated. And then they came and they're swimming underwater and I see them underwater and I reach down and I pull them both up on the ledge and they're standing there and I'm happy they're there. And I said to them, one day when you guys get married and have kids, you'll know what it's like to be a dad and worry like I just did. And then it just occurred to me, I'm standing here talking to both of my sons. Both of them, not just one of them. Christopher is standing right next to me and I'm looking at him and I realize how wonderful it is I'm talking to him and then I wake up. So when you've lost a loved one, this, this happens in your dreams. So on one hand, you're sort of happy. Well, let me rephrase that. On one hand, you're really happy to see them, but always in the dream they have to leave or they're going away from you or you wake up from your dream and you wish you could live in that space again. But... One day I will see my son again because of the resurrection of Jesus. I know there are people here listening to me and say, Greg, come on, it's been 14 years. But you know, every time I bring this up, people come and they thank me and say, we just lost our child. And that really helped us what you said. And you know, and I always think of those people because we're all kind of part of a little family that we never wanted to join, a club we never wanted to be in. But I, it's always encouraging to be reminded that when our loved ones who have died in faith leave us, that they're not just a part of our past, they're also a part of our future. That's very important, isn't it? So let me close this message by saying what I said earlier. You can be closer to God than even Elijah was. Yeah, but God spoke to Elijah all the time. He never speaks to me, you say. Uh, question, do you own one of these? By the way, this is called the Bible. Yes. Filled with the words of God. And God will speak to you through the Bible. Well, like, do you have to read it? Can you scroll it? No. Is God on Instagram? Not really. Can he just shoot me a quick t tweet or text? That almost went the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> we'll just keep moving. No, he wants you to discipline yourself and open up the word of God and you will find God is speaking to you. God speaks to me all the time through the Bible and I'll speak to you as well. You can have this relationship with the Lord and you can have the hope of the afterlife and more than the afterlife, the hope of being with Christ and the hope of being with loved ones that have preceded you to heaven who died in faith. But that hope only comes to Christ. And if you've never asked him to come into your life, you can do it right here, right now. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person in this room, if they don't know you yet, if you're not living in their hearts, let this be the moment they believe. Let this be the moment they invite Jesus into their hearts, we pray. Well, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together. Maybe there's somebody here today that would say, I need Jesus. Uh, I don't know that he lives inside of me right now. Uh, I don't know that I'll go to heaven when I die, but I want to. I want to start a relationship with God. Would you pray for me? Listen, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, if you want this relationship with God I've been talking about, wherever you are, would you just lift your hand up and let me pray for you. Lift up your hand saying, I need Jesus today. Pray for me, God bless you. Wherever you are, raise your hand up, I'll pray for you today. God bless you, wherever you are. Jesus will come and take residence in your heart and forgive you of all of your sin, but you have to call out to him. The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Anybody else, you want Christ to come into your life? Raise your hand up, let me pray for you. God bless you. You that have raised your hand, 
Pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Come into my life now. Be my Lord, be my Savior. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless each one of you. Hey, well, that was my dad giving that message, talking about Elijah. And if you prayed just now to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, first of all, congratulations. Best decision that you've ever, uh, you could ever make in this life, that's for sure. Um, I put my faith in Christ at a very young age, and then I made a rededication at 22 years old. And I tell you what, um, best thing that I ever could have done, he transformed my life. He gave me a new nature. And making Jesus the Lord of my life making sure that the things that I do are in line with his will to the best of my ability through the power of the Holy Spirit has changed me so much I can't even begin to tell you. And so thinking of all of you who are watching this service and prayed with my dad just now just gives me chicken skin. Just thinking about um, those first moments of being a Christian and what that really means and, and being this new person, really a whole new way to be human. Really, we are so excited for you. And honestly, um, you're going to need help in this process. I'll be honest. You need help. You need community. You need people helping you along in this journey. And uh, right now, there's a, a link up on your screen. It's harvest.org slash Bible. If you're watching on harvest.org, you can click that button that says, I think I, I prayed with Pastor Greg. Or if you're watching on YouTube or somewhere else, you can go to harvest.org slash Bible. And we want to send you your very own copy of the New Believer's Bible. This is the New Testament written in the New Living Translation, and it includes a ton of notes. Notes that my dad has compiled over his many years of ministry, put in here for a new believer like yourself, or for someone who's making a rededication and really wants to understand what does it mean to be a Christian? What are the cornerstones of the Christian faith? What are some insights that will help me stay away from temptation and really walk this way that God has called me to? It's all right here in the New Believer's Bible. And we want to get you your copy um, for free. That's our gift to you today. Fill out that info. We'll get you that Bible. And that concludes our um, weekend's edition of Harvest at Home. God bless you. We will see you next weekend. Thanks for joining us. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under, no. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. He's never.
my God will never, ever fail. That's a sermon by itself. <laughs> he's mighty and he's powerful. And we believe in you, Jesus. We're not just singing a song in this place because we know that you won't fail. You can't fail. Great can win blue, but my house was built on. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it. Come on and sing that with me. Rain came. Rain came away. It's a simple song. Come on. Built on. I'm safe with you. I'm safe with you. Jesus, we love you. We praise your name for the truth that you never fail.